Hello, and welcome to the Shipwreck Archive. Thank you. Would you happen to have the Palme Rescue? Here we are. Enjoy! In a normal storm, Dublin Bay would have offered some shelter and safety to a ship in a storm. It was clear that this was not a normal storm, though, and the Palm Bay was in trouble. For the population of Kingstown, Ireland, watching from the shore, a feeling of helplessness set in as they watched the bark drag its anchor, bringing it closer and closer to the rocks. As word spread through Kingstown, more and more people came down to watch, in spite of the blowing spray, harsh winds, and roaring waves. This was not the general manner in which the people of Kingstown spent their Christmas Eve, but in a place so closely tied to the ocean, everyone wanted to be on hand when a ship was in trouble. The people aboard the Palme were also aware of the trouble they were in. The captain's fears were undoubtedly heightened by the fact that his family was on board the ship. Captain Axel Wyron was traveling not only with his wife Lydia, but also with their daughter Esther, who was only five months old. The Palme was Captain Wyron's first ship. He had only been recently certified, and his appointment was in no small part due to his status as a son of the owner of the vessel. The Palme was not as fresh as her captain. She had started her life as a Frederick Tudor in 1866 for an American interest. By the time that she found herself in Dublin Bay in 1895, she had gone from an American ship to a German ship to a Finnish ship flying a Russian flag. She had also seen the fall of the Age of Sail. The rise of steam had taken hold, and the old white-sailed ships of old were now considered outdated and obsolete. Still, she was well-built and considered a good ship for her age. Better yet, the 997-ton ship had just had a refit that ensured that she was at her best. No matter how well rebuilt she had been, however, Captain Wyron had known the danger when the storm had blown up, and having been beaten back to Irish shore, he had made the sensible choice to try to reach a safe harbor. Unfortunately, Dublin Bay was proving to not be as safe as hoped. Waves washed over the ship while she was at anchor, and that was only while the anchors held. As the ship drifted closer and closer to the aptly named Razor Bank, they could only hope that help was on its way. The area around Dublin Bay was no stranger to ships in distress, and as a result, they had more than one life-saving crew that could be called upon to act in these situations. The problem they faced was the very same conditions that had driven the Palme into such a dire situation in the first place. The first idea was to launch a steam tug to pull a rescue lifeboat behind it. And indeed, they had almost put this plan into action when the owners of the tug pulled out at the last minute. This was one of the worst storms anyone could remember seeing. No one wanted to risk their crews and ships in such waters. No matter how bad the conditions were, the life-saving station was able to collect 24 volunteers to gather at the lifeboats and prepare for a rescue attempt. By now, the Palme was on the rocks, and her crew was undertaking the task of cutting away her mast and rigging, the only way to try to stop her from being dashed into pieces on the rocks that they had left. It was clear to all that there was no time left to spare. The first lifeboat was launched, while the second lifeboat went in search of more men to man her so that she could follow. The obvious choice to find more men was the HMS Melampus, and when asked, the entire crew volunteered to fill the lifeboat numbers. Six of these men were selected, and the second boat set out. They did not immediately know the fate of the first lifeboat. When Civil Service No. 7, as the lifeboat was named, set out, it had seemed as though it was going to reach the wreck. People on shore strained their eyes and brought out binoculars and telescopes in an attempt to see the heroic efforts of the crew. As she came about for a leeward rescue, however, a wave washed over her and the small boat was flipped over. Rescue lifeboats have always been small and frail in comparison with the elements that they face, and some thought over the years has been put into their design as a result. By the late 1800s, one of the features of a lifeboat was that they had air pockets to allow them to be self-riding. Everyone who watched from the shore for the small boat to flip back over waited in vain, however. 
Something had gone wrong with the civil service number seven. It stayed as it was, the keel facing the sky, and the crew that had manned her in the deadly water. It had not only been the people on shore who had been watching her journey. The crew of the Palma had also seen her fate, and now they jumped into action. Unable to just stand and watch as their would-have-been rescuers struggled against the storm without a boat, the Palma attempted to launch her own lifeboat to rescue them. Unfortunately, the roaring waves that had flipped the civil service number seven were not any more gentle now, and they smashed the lifeboat against the hull of the Palme as they attempted to launch it. Now they had no way of attempting to reach the shore of their own volition and could only watch as the men of the civil service seven sank beneath the waves. The second lifeboat, the Hannah Pickard, now set out to make her attempt. She was even smaller than the civil service number seven, and she did not make it as far as the first lifeboat did. Though they were able to see the upturned boat, the Hannah Pickard was also overturned before they could reach her and search for survivors. Unlike the civil service number seven, however, the Hannah Pickard righted herself as was intended, and the men were able to scramble back in. Despite the cold, they still tried to strike towards the overturned lifeboat and the stricken bark. Their only reward was to be partially capsized again, something that carried away their mast and half of their oars. It became very clear to everyone on the Hannah Pickard that they were not able to continue any further. Indeed, it was not entirely certain that they would be able to make it back. They certainly could not return to Kingstown. Instead, they turned their boat to Black Rock and managed to land there, damaging the Hannah Pickard badly enough that they would not be able to set out in her again that day, even if the weather were to abate, which it did not. Through the night of Christmas Eve and into Christmas morning, the entire town held vigil, not only for the palme that was still being smashed against the rocks, but also in the hope that some of the lifeboat men might have survived the upset of civil service number seven. Every one of the men was local with the local family. These hopes were to be dashed as the bodies started to wash ashore the next morning. It quickly became clear that the men of civil service number seven had all met their death in their mission of mercy for the crew of the wrecked palme. The palme remained mostly intact, however, and signs of life were still seen on her with her distress flags still flying. In spite of the local tragedy, the people of Dublin Bay were still determined to rescue the crew of the bark. The storm had not abated, however. Her main deck house had been washed away, and while the crew was able to find shelter in the poop deck house during low tide, the high tide would drive them back out on the deck and into the elements. Through all of this, they were only able to make some hot coffee to raise their spirits, though it was said later that Lydia Wyron was instrumental in keeping everyone's spirits up, not allowing anyone to become depressed or despondent. In Black Rock, boat builders worked to repair the Hannah Pickard, and a new group of volunteers stood ready to attempt the rescue again. It was not to be. Through Christmas Day and through the night, the storm still did not cease enough to allow anyone to make another attempt. Still, the people around Dublin Bay watched and waited, hoping for their chance to offer aid. The chance came the day after Christmas, as the turret under the charge of Captain McCombie managed to steam out onto the bay. Captain McCombie had initially attempted to join the rescue on Christmas Day, but the storm had driven his tender back. Now, the waves were still choppy, but conditions had improved enough that he was able to draw close to the wrecked palme and lower his own ship's boat. The rescue took two trips of the small boat of the tender, and at one point, the boat was almost capsized as the others before her had been. But finally, the crew of the Palme found themselves headed to shore. Here, all was warm hospitality, and celebration at their delivery from a watery fate. The crew was put up in hotels to recover, and the inquests began. The largest question on everyone's mind was why was it that Civil Service Number 7 had not righted herself as she had been designed to do? The Hannah Pickard was an older and smaller ship, and yet she had righted herself without incident, something that had saved her crew. Something had clearly gone wrong on the civil service number seven. It was also something that caused deep concern in the life-saving service. The civil service number seven was not the only one made by that pattern. Soon, her local sister ship was being put through rigorous tests where they capsized her under different conditions to ensure that she too would not betray her crew. 
She did exactly as she should and popped back around to an upright position. Their investigation was damaged even further by the people who gathered around civil service number 7 when she was retrieved. At that time, not all of the bodies had washed ashore, and holes were made in her to ensure that no one was trapped inside of her. After that came the souvenir hunters, though, and they took pieces of her to remember the horrors of that day. No one had thought to observe what she looked like when they had brought her to shore, and so there was no way of knowing if something on her had failed. The mystery of what caused civil service number 7 to fail is one of the many mysteries that is not likely to ever be solved. The funeral of the 15 drowned lifeboatmen was attended by thousands of people and featured a march of fishermen, the crew of the Palme, the crews of the other life-saving boats, and local dignitaries. The men of the HMS Melampus stood as an honor guard as the men were interred. The dependents of the men who had drowned in their mission of mercy were also not forgotten, and almost immediately sums of money from all over the sympathetic nation began pouring in to ensure that they would not suffer more than they had already had by the loss of their loved ones. A monument to the men was also erected and still stands near the life-saving station, commemorating their heroism and sacrifice. All the men who were aboard the lifeboat that day were experienced men of the sea, so it is fitting that their memorial should stand so close to the waters that were their life and then their death. The Palme faded into obscurity almost immediately. The men who had been her crew were given some money from the fund that had been raised and were sent back home. Captain Wyron put the wreckage of the Palme up for sale and it was purchased for a very small amount by a local carpenter who took the wood and built local outbuildings with it. The Palme was not insured at the time of her loss so even this amount of money was better than nothing. By 1910, the Palme had entirely slipped beneath the waves of Dublin Bay. The Palme will always be a side note in this story, however. No one remembers the affairs of the wreck of the Palme, but the locals still remember the story of the Kingstown lifeboat disaster. For more of the story of the Palme and the local history around the wreck and civil service number 7, Please see The Palme Shipwreck and the Dublin Bay Lifeboat Disaster of 1895 by Cormac F. Loth, or see the sources listed in the description below. Thank you for listening. Thank you for visiting the Shipwreck Archives. See you soon.